Thanks, Dr. Landrigan and Dr. Foreman. It's great to see you all here today, and it's an honor to speak with you. I'm going to be talking about plastics exposure in childhood. What's the evidence? So plasticizers are added to plastics because they impart flexibility and durability. And two that you've seen in the media of late are phthalates and bisphenol A. And these are two that we're actually studying in our own center of children's environmental health here at Mount Sinai. Concerns exist about the potential to disrupt the endocrine system. So these plasticizers have the potential to mimic hormones. This is largely based on animal studies and very little human studies. So what do parents ask us as pediatricians as as, and, and as environmental pediatricians? So they basically come to us asking, how do I know if toys contain phthalates? Are bottles with bisphenol A harmful? You may have seen this on, the, on various websites. What are the current regulations? What health effects should I look for? And what alternatives can my child use? So let's um, talk a little bit about phthalates. Where are phthalates found? So they're typically found in plastics such as these, childcare products and toys. Um, they're added because they impart flexibility and durability, as I mentioned, to food packaging and even medical supplies, so IV tubing in uh, feeding tubes and um, blood tubes. And these plastics then generate dust. So they're even found in the dust in your homes. And then you can be exposed either through ingestion or an inhalation. Um, they're also found in cosmetics and personal hygiene products. So they're added to shampoos and perfumes and fragrances. Um, they minimize chipping of nail polish and they're used as a scent stabilizer in fragrances. So really widely prevalent in the community. So here are the various products that you can find phthalates in. These are the different types of phthalates that you may see in these products. And then these phthalates, once we're exposed, get broken down into metabolites. And these are the metabolites that we can measure in the human body. This is only done for research purposes at this, at this time. So the Centers for Disease Control in a national population across the United States is looking at these exposures over time. So there have been three reports on human exposures. Um, looking at various phthalates, and these are the metabolites, in the U.S. population, 6 to 85. And so what you notice here is that the 6 to 11-year-old, the youngest population surveyed, actually had higher level of phthalates as compared to adolescents, 12 to 19 years old, who also had higher levels than their adult counterparts. So kids are not small adults. They actually have higher exposures, and this is for a number of different reasons. As I mentioned, um, we really know about health effects based on a number of animal studies, but the number of human studies is actually very limited. And so a summary of, a find, of the findings in animal studies is that there's evidence of adverse birth outcomes, there's reproductive toxicity, and that we know that the male reproductive tract is particularly sensitive to these exposures. With respect to human studies, there are really very few human studies looking at these exposures. And they're now looking at whether or not there's a relationship between phthalates exposure and asthma, puberty, and body size. But the relationship at this point is unclear. The European Union, however, has taken a precautionary pr approach. And in 1999, they instituted a temporary ban of these phthalates. And in 2005, they actually instituted a permanent ban of three phthalates in toys and child care articles. And they banned these three phthalates from toys and childcare articles that can be mouthed. So their legislation defines a childcare article as any product that's intended to facilitate sleep, relaxation, hygiene, the feeding of children, or sucking on the part of children. And they define any article that can be placed in the mouth as anything that can be brought to the mouth and kept in the mouth so that it can be sucked and chewed. And generally, these are objects that are less than five centimeters in size. So here's actually a sample from their guidance document on items that can be placed in the mouth. Here's a toy mower. Um, and they identify the handle as an area that can be mouthed. So therefore, none of the six phthalates can be present in this handle, whereas the body of the mower, which is greater than five centimeters, um, can contain those three phthalates that I mentioned earlier. But we know that kids are remarkably innovative and will find ways to get their mouth on this, these objects. Um, so what are we doing here in the United States? So California just recently, Governor Schwarzenegger um, signed the first uh, phthalates ban. 
and it will be effective in 2009. There are six phthalates um, in their ban. It applies to all toys and childcare products, and it targets those products um, for kids that are less than three years old. It prohibits the manufacture, sale, and distribution of any of those toys for kids under three. So it'll be interesting to see how this influences the U.S. market. So what can you do to reduce uh, phthalates exposure? Given what we know about animal studies and the limited evidence in human studies, you can take a precautionary approach. So you can avoid the use of plastics in the microwave and dishwasher. So basically, high heat can promote leaching of the plasticizers into the foods. So that's one thing you can avoid. You can wet mop and dust frequently to minimize exposure to dust that may contain phthalates. And you look, can look for this type of label. This product is free of harmful phthalates on any products. And in the absence of labeling, you can look to recycling labels. So this number three sign, which is present underneath on the bottom of um, plastic containers, indicates polyvinyl chloride, which can contain lead, actually, but it can also contain phthalates. So that's something that you can look for. Number three, phthalate, uh, number three plastics can contain phthalates. Something to remember. Dr. Luz Claudio in our uh, research center has uh, developed this handy guide. It's a pocket guide to plastics, which indicates that if you look at the recycling labels, one, two, four, and five are considered the safer plastics. And the plastics to avoid are three, which I just mentioned may contain phthalates, six, which is polystyrene or styrofoam, and seven, which, is bis which may contain bisphenol, A, they're basically polycarbonates. And we're gonna switch gears now and start to talk about bisphenol A. So bisphenol A is another plasticizer you may have heard of recently in the media. Bisphenol A lines canned foods. It's found in hard, durable plastics like water dispensers, baby bottles, and even water bottles. And it's used in dental sealants. And it's often referred to as BPA. So BPA exposure is widespread. And we know from the national sample in the United States um, by a study by Califat et al. Um, from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey of 2003 to 2004, but the US population, six to 85 years old, is universally exposed. So it was detectable in 93% of the population. And even in the kids, six to 11 years old, of which 217 kids were included in the sample, the geometric mean for bisphenol A was 4.3 micrograms per gram of creatinine. And just like we saw with phthalates, the levels in the kids were higher than the levels in the adolescents, which both were higher than the levels in the adults. So kids are uniquely vulnerable to exposures. What do we know? So bisphenol A is a weak estrogen, and we know from animal studies that it's associated with adverse birth outcomes. Again, the male reproductive tract is uniquely sensitive. It's been associated with early puberty in animals and increased body size. And there are very limited human studies um, looking at the relationship, and we don't know about exposures in infants um, and younger age kids below six. It has not been classified yet with respect to car uh, a ca being classified as a cancer-causing agent. So what can you do to take a precautionary approach? So you can look for stainless steel water bottles as opposed to the water bottles I, I demonstrated earlier. You can also look for bisphenol A-free baby bottles. So this one actually happens to be BPA-free and phthalate-free as well. And I believe Rhonda Sherwood has brought some samples in for us today. You can choose alternatives to canned foods, so choose fresh fruits and vegetables and consider alternatives to canned infant formula, so yet another reason why breast milk is best. You can also select glass food containers, um, but proceed with caution because of the potential for breakage. And you can again look to recycling labels um, in the absence of uh, legislation requiring labeling for bisphenol A. So the number seven plastics may contain bisphenol A. Again, these are polycarbonates. Not all number seven plastics contain bisphenol A. It's the one thing to keep in mind. And just as a reminder, the safer plastics are one, two, four, and five, and the plastics to avoid are three, which may contain lead and phthalates, polystyrene six, or styrofoam, and seven, which may contain BPA or bisphenol A. And that's it, thank you very much. Just want to acknowledge our research staff, our research staff, our community partners, and our funding agencies.